All right, Brent Porcio here, Top Velocity. Got a special interview with Mike Reinold. I really wanted to do this interview with Mike just because he just wrote a, he wrote a great article on velocity programs and kind of their contribution into the health of arms today. And I think it creates a really good co uh, uh, conversation about uh, what's the future of, of velocity and what's the best approach and what's the healthy approach. So um, thanks for doing this with me, Mike. I really appreciate it. And um, I hope we can kind of get into the nuts and bolts of this and help some kids really understand what's going on. Those kids are out there that are trying to, you know, get themselves to the next level and really need good information. So I'm hoping this will be that good information. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Brent. Um, big fan, obviously, of your Thanks, podcast man. and stuff. Um, I reached out to Brent like a couple months ago and picked his uh, brain for some camera advice yeah. and stuff like that. Cause, I mean, your, your podcast is just well done, not only just Thanks. the content, but just the quality of it. So oh, cool, I, I stole some stuff from Brent. No, so no problem. Was, uh, hey, that's, what we, that's what we all do. We steal stuff from each other. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. No, we both stole from Gary V. So yeah, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> big big shout out to Gary V. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. He deserved it. Yeah, I know. All right, cool. Um, well, um, talk first talk about you. Tell, tell, tell everybody who you are. Fill them in on that. And then we'll go into why you did this article. Yeah, sure, no problem. Um, so I'm a physical therapist, athletic trainer, strength coach. Um, I have a place up in Boston called Champion PT and Performance. Uh, it's a PT place, but we have uh, you know a bunch of baseball training and stuff. I'll show you a little. If you look out nice. on the other side of my uh, of my uh, my office here, cool. um, we do the rehab, but we have the baseball training, the strength and conditioning, all that stuff with cool. with uh, the group we work here. So um, I was uh, I was the head athletic trainer for the Red Sox for some time. So. Um, quite a bit of experience working within Major League Baseball, and I got to work with the elite level guys. I got to work with, you know, Cy Youngs and All Stars, and, and the thing that every kid wants to be. Uh, but before that, I worked for quite a while down in Birmingham with Dr. James Andrews. So um, it's a really weird combo that I have because I've seen probably you know thousands of, of healthy baseball players and thousands of injured baseball players. Yeah. <laughs> so and it's amazing when I went into Major League Baseball from the rehab setting, there was a lot of you know misconceptions I had there from just being a rehab guy that. I had to kind of relearn when I got into the healthy environment, <laughs> and then vice versa. So um, I think if you're just working with healthy people, or if you're just working with injured people, you start to assume quite a quite a bit of things, and then when you start to realize that, you kind of got to put that together. It's interesting. So that's awesome. Um, so, you know, yeah. so that's my background. So that's where my approach comes in. When we write an article or something like this, is I'm seeing everybody, I'm seeing everybody try to maximize their performance and enhance their velocity and do whatever they can because they feel like they need to. Uh, but then I'm also seeing them when they break themselves afterwards. So, um, I'm, you know, and I'm not saying that everybody breaks themselves, but I see that. You know, so putting that together is, you know, for me, I just I'm trying to help the kids. In all honesty. Yeah, so you're you're getting a lot of those cases firsthand. So you're not just like talking out of your butt here. Like in the article, you said it's not common for you to hear the kid say, "Hey, I gained three to whatever, two to three, three to five on on a weighted ball program." But all of this, I've never hurt my arm before, and now I just hurt my arm. So you're saying that's that's something that's become common. Is that become common in the past five years, in the past two years, in the past ten years? I, I would say it's definitely increased in the past two and. Five is probably the window where it started, but the last two, it's, it's I don't want to say it's getting out of hand, but it's clearly, it, it made me write that article. You know, okay, so yeah, so that's why you wrote that article. So yeah. that, is that what, you're, what we were trying to accomplish? Like, what was your really motivation? What's your passion behind really getting that information out? I mean, is it just coming from the fact that you're kind of sick and tired of, of this, what's going on? Or and are you trying to educate and, and you really need to fill that void? I mean, what, what was your purpose? I, I mean, to me, um, it, it's just like anything else. The, the pendulum is swinging right now, and the pendulum is in one direction right now, and, and we're getting carried away. We're, um, I, you know, I spent this winter. I spoke at both the Professional Baseball Athletic Trainer Society and the ASMI's Injuries in Baseball course, and we spent like no less than eight hours together at those two courses, talking about the the rise in Tommy John injuries and how we're failing and how we can't stop it, and it's just getting worse every year. Um, so it's 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 actually getting depressing because uh, we're having more injuries. They're happening at an earlier age, and the, all these great advances advancements we're doing at both the youth level as well as even at the professional level, it's not working. So we're, we have to figure out what's going on, and I, I I think what's coming down is this is the velocity era, and just becomes an equation. You know, force equals mass times acceleration, right? It's just you know it is what it is. Yeah, and I feel like the problem is is as much as the the 
the players are putting the pedal to the metal, the coaches and the, the trainers are trying to be the brake. And I, and I don't think it, that's what's not working. I think we need right. to help them put the pedal to the metal, but in a better way. No doubt. No doubt. If, well, what's happening right now is um, internet marketing has gotten successful, yeah, right? right. <laughs> so, I mean, and we're both online guys, so we, I mean, we get that concept. Internet marketing is successful right now. The problem is not your program, my program, this guy's program. That's not the problem. The problem is, is the kids are doing them all. And they're doing them all simultaneously, and they're all they're they're doing what kind of what I wanted to get a point, the point across in my article is all these things are effective, but we're overdosing. You know, we're just we're just doing too much, and and we're not getting that. The major point of my article is actually quite simple. Um, I think in about ten years ago or so, we started publishing all the data from ASMI that showed that the number one reason we get injured is from overuse. So what we you know one of the biggest recommendations can't pitch for more than eight months out of the year. If you start pitching for more than eight months, your injury um, percentage goes up five times. You're five times more likely to get injured, which is unacceptable to me if you pitch more than eight months. So what we started to do is we started to pitch less and do different things, but then we started to do training programs. And that's fine, but now it's been five years or so, we're starting to see the data on these training programs, and they're showing they're equally as stressful and sometimes more stressful than pitching off the mound. So I always ask guys, like, all right, how, how often are you long tossing? I'm trying to see who's behind me right now. <laughs> yeah, picks on one knuckle, of Some of the knuckleheads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, they, uh, you know, so you're long tossing three days a week. You're throwing a pen twice a week, and you're doing weighted balls twice a week. I'm like, that doesn't add up. That's that's more than throwing a pen every day. You know, so so it's the science is coming out and the anecdotal info and. You know, looking people up, you know, watching people's Instagrams and saying that everybody does great. I mean, that's not real. That's not science. And the science is showing something different than what I think is being out there right now. Yeah, I mean, I'm a guy who tore my rotator cuff at 18 and had to, you know, doctors pretty much at that point, 1995, saying, look, you don't really have it in you to do this by yourself and recover from this with four more years of college baseball. You're kind of, you're wasting your time. So I had several doctors say, look, yeah. it's just a big waste of time. Well, I, I was just a guy who was very in you know, passionate about what I did, did. I loved baseball. I wanted to get back into it. So, you know, in, in learning all this and really developing this program that got me back to where I was, th this program was how much or what, what's the least amount I can throw but still gain the most amount of performance out of my body. So what's I was that? forced to learn a different road than throwing in my offseason. So my offseason programs, okay, yeah, we throw, but they're very low stress throws. I'm more focused on like a trainer, like, how can I make my body so athletic, so explosive that when I eventually my arm is prepared and and built the stamina to, to throw say two three innings or, or five six innings as a starter, that it, it's going it to perform at, at an optimal level at a peak performance? And I all that's been my approach from here on out, and I, and I truly believe that's the safest way because, like you're saying, these these programs that are so off season programs that are throwing focused, that's not the approach. The approach is how much can we overstress the arm. To, to enhance performance as opposed to how much can we just stress the body all together and let it distribute the loads, which would be right. more healthy, as opposed to just picking on the arm, you know? Yeah, so, I, I, I don't know if I could say that any better. I think you just, I mean, you hit it on the head right there. That was perfect. Um, when we talk about how to enhance velocity in people, um, <coughs> excuse me, when we talk about how to enhance velocity in people, we say there's four mechanisms that we tend to get there. Um, one is throwing, so that is, and I, I'll include in throwing that's training programs like long toss, weighted balls, but also biomechanical stuff and just you know work on your mechanics stuff like that. So we'll say throwing. Two is strength and conditioning, and that's you know the whole body stuff like that. You know, getting the power from the legs and transferring it, all that fun stuff. <clears throat> Three is arm care and getting your shoulder like bulletproof, which nobody does. <laughs> it's still amazing that nobody does that to me. Uh, but fine, that's a secret for us that we prosper from. So, <laughs> right, <laughs> so yeah. Three, and then four is age and maturity. And what's happening right now is, of those four categories, you have like a 14-year-old kid that's not mature, not skeletally mature, and not, not old enough. He's never picked up a weight before, and he doesn't even know what the rotator cuff is, but he's getting on an aggressive throwing program, and he's overdosing. And you can be just as bad by, by just doing strength and conditioning or just doing arm care. You're not getting the complete package. Yeah, but, but there's different safety levels, like you said. Well, look, like, and, and you're an ASMI guy. Look at ASMI. They, they said it's more than overuse, right? They said it's poor physical fitness and poor mechanics, right? right? So there's right. three things that typically lead yeah. to youth injury. 
Overuse, right. poor mechanics, poor physical fitness. Does weighted ball training or long toss address any of those issues? Yeah, I, I None. agree they do not. Correct. Right. So, yes. so no wonder they're not getting better in those programs because it's not addressing poor physical fitness, poor mechanics, uh, and overuse. It's typically adding to the overuse. It's reinforcing bad mechanics if you haven't fixed them. And it doesn't develop you physically. It's, right. you know, as far as your legs and core and all that. So I think that's the problem. It's like they're doing these programs without addressing the underlying issues, which we just labeled there, which is critical to the health of the system, right? Right. I, I totally agree. I, I, I mean, we use weighted ball. We use long toss stuff. We do that stuff here. But you just have to know what it does to the body and when to apply it and to, to truly do it well, right? And then, and then you can't overdose. But... You have to have that base, you have to have age, you have to have maturity, you have to have a baseline strength, you have to have good mechanics. What's the point of working on, you know, throwing 300 feet if your mechanics are awful? I mean, what's the point of that? That's just going to make it worse. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and I think, unfortunately, the problem is, is a lot of these kids come, have a lot of misconceptions. So it's like, how do we reach out to these kids and educate these kids who, unfortunately, a lot of this information isn't trickling down. I mean, do you see this information trickling down? And, and, and if not, what do we do to, to help it trickle down, you know? Well, I, the, that's why the article came about. And, and the, so far, the, the positive, um, I've, I've, I actually thought I was going to get crushed as, as a leader, and I was going to have, like, every weighted ball guy. <laughs> I kind of threw it on my Twitter page, like, hey, he's saying it this time, not me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... I Clearly wrote it there saying, like, hey, I believe in it and I do it. Right, right. We're, as a group, we're doing it wrong. Right. So we do, we have to get better. But I, <laughs> I knew I was going to get some heat for that. But the positive, I really haven't gotten that much. Oh, the good. It's good. been fantastic. Uh, Peter Gammons is sending it out. That's Will cool. Carroll's sending it out. Uh, I was in the Boston Globe today. I that's mean, cool. That's, I'm not even that's like, awesome. soliciting some of that that's stuff. Awesome. I mean, that is like, to me, that is, that is, that yeah. is people realizing we have a problem. And we have to start identifying some of those risk factors, and I think they're there. We just, again, not I'm not saying anything's bad. I know you're not saying anything's bad. It's just we're overdosing. We're doing too yeah, much. Yeah, like like we said before, this it's not bad. It's just got to be real in. It's got to be in a range. We right. can't always be in an extreme distance range. We can't always be in an extreme weight of overloading or underloading range. We right. can't always be in even lifting. I can't have guys maxing every day. You know. Uh, you know, we've, we've got to make sure it's all within a range. It's all customized to the athlete and helping them progress uh, healthy, effectively uh, to their goals and not trying to jump. And I think that was the coolest thing you were talking about is like the problem it sounds like with doing an extreme weighted ball approach is that it's almost forcing you to the end result too quickly and then it's causing the body to unravel. I mean, that's what it right. sounds like, right? Right. And I, I would say we... We rarely see injuries during the weighted ball program. We do, and, and, and let's just call them velocity programs because there's other methods out there too. I don't right. want to say okay. I'm so down okay. on the weighted balls, but just on the <clears throat> programs, um, we, 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 we see problems. We see things pop up that we think are from that, but who knows? That guy might have broke down just throwing pens with their coach. Who knows? Um, but we see that, but the people get overstressed and the people break down in the future. So Dr. Fleissig always kind of said this really well when we talk about overuse in Little League. Um, it's not, you're not going to get a bunch of kids at 10 years old that get hurt, but what you're doing, it's like you give them a pack of cigarettes every day, and then, you know, they're not going to get lung cancer when they're in Little League, but, the, you know, down the road, they're just, they're taking some tread off the tire, and, you know, that's how it well, is. Well, I interviewed Jim Morris from the movie The Rookie a long time ago, and He's, you know, he had nine arm surgeries. I don't know if wow. anyone knows that. Yeah, that's, and that's crazy. I think that's more than you. <laughs> well, jeez. And then uh, Dr. Job, I think, did his fifth one. And Dr. Job, I think it was Dr. Job who told him this, said that, you know, Jim, most of the damage you did to your arm, you did before you were 15 years old. Right. And I think right. that's your point exactly. Right. Well, that's why we're seeing injuries with all these 18-year-olds. That's why we're seeing, you know, people, you know, the, one of the studies that I put in there um, was, you know, 10 years ago, Major League Baseball pitchers were having Tommy John when they were like 32. And you could argue they're just at the end of the road there at that point 10 years ago. Um, so they're having them like in their 30s, but now they're having them like in their 20s. 12 or 12. Or the youth are having it before they get to professional ball. So I, we don't know the lifespan of these Tommy Johns, but it's not infinite. So you get a kid having Tommy John at 16, that is not going to be good for your career. <laughs> and, and, but, <laughs> yeah. Right. And, and what I think the challenge to all this is I think kids are going to want to more just discredit even the conventional wisdom because they realize nothing's working. 
So unfortunately, I think we're going to have chaos before we have some type of plan or focus to improve on this. Because I think right. everyone's just going to be like, well, you know, there's no proven method. Everyone's getting hurt and, and just do whatever. And I th that could be where we are. Like you said, everyone's doing everyone's yeah. program. So, I mean, what's it going to take till – I think it's going to take from the top, Major League Baseball, you know, putting it out there and showing it, it's being implemented into their organizations that we have protocols and we're having success. I think once one team shows that we have a protocol and we have success, I think everyone's going to start to follow. Right. Well, I mean, let's go back in history, right? So what's probably the greatest rotation of all time? Maybe I'm dating myself here because I don't, maybe there's an awesome rotation in the 30s that I don't know yeah, about. Yeah, the Braves, right? The Braves, yeah. right? You know what the Braves did in between starts? What? Crap. They, like, did nothing. Nothing, yeah. They played golf. <laughs> they, they, yeah, they really did. Um, they didn't even throw pens a lot. So I got to work with Smoltz, and that was kind of some of the big things we talked about was, like, look, man, you've been one of the most successful people. You know, what's your secret and stuff? Doesn't throw a lot of pens. You know, they're throwing a lot of flat ground, just playing catch. Nobody long tosses. Nobody's throwing weighted balls. Like that, that's some of the most successful rotations ever. So um, we're not seeing these programs implemented at the major league level. You know, that they're just not there. So I try to tell some of the kids that, that, you know, they think everybody's doing it. I'm like, nobody's doing well, it. Well, you know, but you know <laughs> what? Nobody, I, none of these jerseys behind us right. have, have ever done these programs. Well, I think some, <laughs> I think it's beginning, though. I, I had the Cleveland Indians come down here, and they wanted to learn. I mean, right. and, and they've looked at Wolf Wars. They've looked at um, Driveline. And so I think it's starting. Some of these low-budget teams are starting. I think they just want to know what these kids are doing. Right. Well, remember, though, it's a, an assistant GM or a GM doesn't know the signs. They don't know it. So all they're, they're doing, they're seeing the same thing the kids are seeing. They're seeing Instagram videos and supposed success stories like that. That's what they're, that's what they're seeing right now. So that's why the article was written. That's why we're trying to get that out is everybody needs to know this. And I've had many people in baseball, you know, from teams reach out to me and they're like, okay, that makes more sense. That really clarifies why we're not implementing these things with people we've paid millions of dollars for. Okay. So I think the best thing to do now, let's just give them a good understanding of what they're doing the ranges they need to be careful with and and kind of maybe give them some value out of this so like can you talk a little bit about what you're doing with uh with with you said some case studies and and what what uh information is coming out of that and, and what are you seeing is going to be a healthy approach um in these kind of training protocols okay well I, i'd say the number one thing we're seeing that i think people need to know about weighted balls right now is that it's changing people's physiology it's changing their anatomy right now. So what I mean by that, we're in the middle of probably about three studies that we're in different phases with here at Champion where we're looking at stuff like what happens after a six-week program? What happens immediately? I want to know what happens right when you get off. So we looked at that with major league players. We said, okay, the second you get off the mound, you've lost internal rotation, you've lost elbow extension. We published that stuff. Now we want to do the same thing. We know pitching, you lose motion. My hypothesis, what I'm thinking with weighted balls, is you gain motion. And that's what we actually started showing. We're still analyzing the data, but people are gaining external rotation. So when your layback goes up, your velocity goes up. That's just a fact, right? But if your layback increases over six weeks, I would be very nervous. <laughs> like, that's not healthy. So you're you know, overstretching like, your rubber band, you know? It's, and, and, and that's saying it nicely. Over six weeks, the, the, your layback comes from one real thing. It's your bone adapting when your growth plates are open. You have a torsion of your bone when you throw as a kid. Over a six-week period, you're not, your muscles are not getting longer, right? In fact, your muscles are getting tighter, and you still gain range of motion. Your bone's not torquing in six weeks. So the only thing to go now is stuff like your capsule, your labrum, your rotator cuff, and those are all things you don't want. That's what you and I, no offense, call the kiss of death, right? Sorry, I know you're a shoulder surgery guy. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the kiss of death right there. Yeah, right. Is, is when you have an anterior shoulder injury. Mm. Um, I'd much rather you hurt your Tommy John than that. Yeah, no, shoulders, the, it was, I, well, after I came out of the surgery, I knew why they said I'd never play again. It was a nightmare. Yeah, you, I mean, you get to, like, right here, you're yeah. like, oh, God, I'm never going to get a layback again. Yeah, and then um, not only that, when you start throwing again, your body doesn't want the stress. I mean, it doesn't, you, you almost throw up when you start to feel it again, you know? Right. Yeah, that's, uh, again, you said it well. So, um, so that's what we're seeing. I mean, for me, I think the biggest things we can do here is, look, all these things are effective because effective means do they enhance velocity. 
that, yes, they enhance velocity. Of course they do. I think that's good. We've known that for two decades that these things uh, advance. Uh, velocity. But I mean, is that, that good velocity? If it's that transfer of training, I mean, are those are those positive increases in velocity, or are we getting so many negatives with it? It's not good velocity. I mean, that's my question. Right, and we and we still don't know yet. This is we're starting to expose that, and I'm I'm, I'm honestly I think it's it's I don't want to say pessimistic, but we're starting to see a lot of like, hey guys, pump the brakes. This might not be as perfect as we think it is. Um, it can be effective, but we don't know how safe it is just yet. And, and just like anything else, I mean, everything's effective to an extent, right? If you've never lifted a weight before and you start deadlifting, you're going to go up. But if I'm going from 185 to 305, 300, yeah. deadlift, yeah, and you pull I'm, 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 and you slip a disc, yeah. But even even if I do that, I mean, I just, just I go from 185 to 300, and I I'm gonna get like a big jump in, in velo from that. My return from going from 300 to 500, is yeah, not it's not gonna be as big. Yeah. Right. <laughs> no, so and that's that's what we're seeing. So now we get the kids; they do a six week program. They're like, all right, I gained two miles an hour. Let's do it again. Yeah, you right. Know, let's go. Let's go. Ahead. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's go exactly. Forward. You know, it's like yeah, if that if that can be two miles, if I do it again, I'll be at four miles. Right. You know, so and that's our real problem. What we need to start scaling back on. Um, I would never do any of this stuff in a skeletally immature person. And I actually don't know anyone on the internet that that talks about these programs that would either. So that's a compliment to everybody out there. On a skeletally immature person, the number one thing that you do to gain velocity is get a baseline of strength, and then in all honesty, play catch. That's it. Because you, your bone needs to torque when your girl's blades open. So just play catch, and that happens. You know, I'm working on that with my seven year old right now. Yeah, like just play catch. Yeah, and you know, and I like you know, from the the Olympic approach, being a USA weightlifting certified coach, and you know, Matt Bruce is a good friend of mine. He's an Olympian, and he made this talked about how you know, if you took two guys, say they're both twins and they're identical, and this one you just focused on how much performance he could push out in, in weight training. Yeah, this guy might get to you know you know one two or 120 percent of his body weight before this guy. But if you sat this guy here and you trained him technically. And you did base level strength training, and, and, you, and you prepared the body for for you know the improvements taking off, and then you started to build in or started push him through the lifts and through the weight through the loads. He would blow past this guy and far exceed this guy. And I really think that's got to be the approach in anything you do if you're if you're doing right. a throwing program. If it's got to be a technical base that has to be established first, so then right. you can build the stress on that technical base because that's a more efficient system that can distribute those loads better and more than likely not only go up higher in performance just because of the potential of, of, of making those gains but also because the body's healthier and will allow that to occur more. Absolutely. It comes back to those four things. Age maturity, throwing, strength, arm care. If you're, if you're out of balance and you're putting all your eggs in one basket, it's not going to work well. You have to add them there, and you have to realize that that foundation needs to happen first. You said it perfect. There's no point on getting on these aggressive advanced programs if you haven't put the work in for the foundation. There's no shortcuts in making, you know, making the big leagues, pitching for Vandy, whatever it is that your goal is there. There's no shortcuts. You have to put that baseline in. I, I have kids working with me now that are you know, 12 years old that have stronger shoulders than some of our college kids because they've been putting effort into it. And the college kid just, he was the gifted kid in his town that never had to work for it. And now all of a sudden he realizes, if I'm going to make it to that next level, i got to start working for it. Yeah, and that's the, the other big problem here. And I think that's why we're in this position as well is, is unfortunately, these kids don't want really want to work in baseball. I feel like Unfortunately, it's how they chose the sport of baseball. They were like, you know what? I, I don't want to play football. I got two a days. Uh, I don't want to do soccer. I got to run, su you know, the field. I don't want to do basketball. I got to do suicide. Oh, I'm gonna go. Be, I'm gonna go play baseball. I mean, yeah. unfortunately, I feel like we initially choose the sport because of that. I mean, that wasn't me. I was a multi-sport athlete, but right. but because of that, you get these mentalities of like, oh wait, you know, like my programs. Wait, I gotta become an Olympic lifter, and I gotta. A 1.3 power to weight ratio, and then I got to learn all these biomechanics. These are so complicated. Well, yeah, right. I'm going to go and, and find something easier. Do you feel like you see that as well? These kids are just looking for the easy road, and that's what's making them fall into these risky programs. Yeah, I mean, it's it's everyone's looking for the path of, of least resistance. You know, that's that's what it comes down to, and it's you know, I mean, look. You can you go to the gym and work your tail off for three months. It's fantastic. Then you go in season, you stop working out because you're an idiot. And you don't do in season training, and then all of a sudden you're, you lose you're weak again, yeah. and you're like, oh crap, I got to start over again. 
but you know what? I'm playing catch anyway. Let me just let me just do this. I'll throw a little line or whatever. But it's more fun. It's more fun to do train that way than to go in the gym and grind. You know, but that's you know that's not how you build. It's not how you build. You know, the the, the pro athlete. So do you find yourself being a motivator um, and just keeping them motivated to do this stuff, or what? What really keeps them to stick in your programs? For me, it's motivation through education. Yeah. You know, so one is, you know, I, I can use a little bit of the of the background, the experience, and just say, like, look, this is this is the programs I implemented with the Red Sox. This is what pro guys use. You know, we get a bunch of pro guys that, that do stuff with us, so it's easy to tell the kids, like, that's what they're doing. So that's that's easy, but it becomes education. When somebody comes to us because their shoulder hurts, the, like, the, the least important thing we do is make their shoulder feel better. What we do is we educate them why they hurt their shoulder and, and what that means in the future. And the first thing we teach everybody, the number one principle we always say is, look, throwing a baseball is not good for you. Okay? Once you understand that, that's fine. Now you have to understand you can't throw all day. You can't do that stuff. It's fine. We have to build up your body. We have to put as much sand in the hourglass as we can. Whatever analogy you want to use, it's educating the kids that you have to have the proper foundation can't work to overuse and just keep burning it out and you have to maintain that and then you know they always ask like all right when do I when do I have to stop doing you know basic rotator cuff exercises like yeah when you're when you're done playing baseball yeah exactly you know, because, because you know you'll be fine in life you can play frisbee on the weekends if you want but like I would you know, I would even <laughs> say if you've played baseball for a long time you better keep doing rotator cuff exercises yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me put it this way you have a slap there, and yeah. your cuff is torn, and when you're 55, you're probably going to notice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You won't be able so, to pick up your kids. Yeah, yeah no doubt, no doubt. So, well, cool. So, I, I, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No, uh, fin finish up. I, I want to kind of close. So finish up what you're saying, and, and then go into kind of like maybe the last something that you'd like to, to say and, and, and closure on, on your article and on this whole conversation. Well, I, I, the biggest thing I, I hope people get from the article is just understanding that the science is coming out, and it's not out there. People tell you that the science is out there right now. It's not out there. Anything that's being done on the internet now is, is anecdotal information. That's not real science. So the science is. So you're out talking about as, science on what? Can you be specific to like what specific science? Like, like meaning like I want to see studies that show the exact stress that's happening on my ligament from the result of doing this. Not anecdotal stuff. Not like one guy that can do a 102, uh, you, you know, run and gun. That's not science. That's anecdotal information. We have to see the science, and we have to see short term and long term. So it's not just okay. What's your immediate gains, or what's your long term ramifications for doing this? You're gaining velocity, but at what cost? So that's that's the real thing we have to learn here. So I guess the biggest thing I want to say is these things work. I guess we just have to apply them better. And it's just like anything else. Just like you just said, it has to be periodized. You have to have the baseline book behind it, and you can't do this all year round. You have to, you know, weighted balls come in, they go out. Long toss comes in, they go out. Bullpens come in, they go out. Games come in. Games come in. If you're still worrying about your weighted ball program during the season, you're it's done. way too late. Yeah, right. Right. <laughs> like, you are what you are, kid. It's only going to get worse over the course of the season. Why? It goes back to principle number one. What's the first thing we taught you? Throwing a baseball is bad for you. So over the course of a season, everything we've ever studied in baseball players, it goes down over the course of the season. So all you're doing is making the sand fall out of your hourglass faster by doing these training things in season. Everything needs to be periodized correctly. Yeah, and, and I truly believe that it's been essential to me having healthy guys in my program is the principle of good biomechanics. Like, you need to understand what good biomechanics are. You need to understand how, what I truly believe, how force needs to come up the chain. If you're trying to overcompensate at the end of the chain and over, you know, accelerate late in the movement, then that, your wear and tear goes up considerably. I mean, my favorite study is Kibler and Chandler calculated a 20% decrease in the kinetic energy delivered from your hip and trunk to the arm. A 20% decrease there requires a 34% increase in the rotational velocity of the shoulder just to keep the same force on the hand. So if, if you're not doing a good job in your training and you're, and you're throwing in your biomechanics to get the force up the chain, then you're going to overcompensate. And over time, it's going to be harder to survive that, specifically if you're trying to push for more velocity and you're just cranking it up harder every day. You, you got it. And most guys aren't going to get hurt that day. It's going to be just, every, it's, look, everybody's baseball career is because they fizzle out. That's how it ends, right? Or we'd all still be playing, right? Nolan Ryan would still be throwing 100 right now, right? You're just making yours go like this instead of like this. Like that, exactly. <laughs> you know? And you're right. And I, and I and tell them there's a lot of pro guys at the big league level even doing this that, that are speeding up the end of their careers 
Uh, no doubt. Right. So tell no, them no it, just because you see a pro guy doing it doesn't mean it's right for you, right? Right. And it's less pro guys than you think. Just when you know somebody sees a pro guy doing it, it's advertised well, but it's less pro guys than you think. You know, the, now, the generation has changed now. But when I first started in pro baseball 10 years ago, we asked everybody, we talked We talked about these things. We said, what did you do? And most of these guys were shortstops. Most of these guys were shortstop center fielders. You know why? That's the best athlete. They're athletes. Exactly. So they're the best athletes. That's it. Did you pitch a lot in high school? Like, nah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there's there's some Josh Beckett's in the world that, yeah. like, you know, was the number one pitcher of Texas or whatever, you know, that type of thing. But, like, it's, it's you know, most guys didn't. And, and that's an interesting thing. I think, you know, worry more about becoming, you know, the best athlete you can be and, and let the other stuff work itself out, I guess. You know, don't push the envelope until you've run out of If you've maximized all those other buckets, push the envelope. But until you have, don't push the envelope. Does that make sense? Uh, that's awesome, man. I think we'll close with that. So I appreciate it. Thanks for giving us your time and your busy schedule. Um, what's your Twitter handle? I'm giving some things to find you. Um, what, yeah, sure. Just my name, just at Mike Reinold. That's uh, M I K E R E I N O L D. And that's my website as well, just MikeReinold.com. So, okay. um, bunch, I have a ton of baseball content on there. So, um, tons, of, tons of stuff on there. Check Good. it out. I appreciate it. Hey, man, I really appreciate it. And a great article. And I hope this information gets out and uh, we'll keep collaborating on this. I'd like to hear when your, more of your case studies come out. So, keep me on your list, all right? Yeah, sounds good, Brent. Thanks hey, for man. having us, man. Yeah, we'll talk soon. Take it easy. See you.